Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week, your Monday rocket rundown of all things rocket-related. We'll be taking a meander down to the coasts of Boca Chica to check in on the latest Starship news, as well as reminisce about all the things that we saw last week, and then move along to previewing all the excited things we have to look forward to this week, both in terms of launches and in terms of all the best historic anniversaries that'll be taking place over the next seven days. So, let's get right to it, beginning, as usual, with all the latest updates regarding SpaceX's Starship development. Down at Starbase, all eyes are currently trained on Starship Booster 3, which is the massive Starship first stage that's currently out at the pad undergoing tests. Now, this is a Pathfinder tank and won't actually be making any flights, and a lot of us thought it would only probably undergo cryo and proofing tests, which have now taken place. Ambient pressure tests were performed on the 8th of July, and cryo testing took place four days later on the 12th. However, excitingly, last week, we saw what looked like SpaceX fitting a Raptor engine to its underside. As of the 13th of July, three Raptor engines have now been fitted to the rocket's underside, presumably for an upcoming static fire test. While obviously not exciting as a hop, like the ones we saw for SN5 and SN6, static fires are still really exciting things to watch, especially ones coming from this monster of a rocket. As it turns out, we probably won't have to wait very long at all for this, as we're expecting SpaceX to perform the static fire test imminently. Probably not today, despite a tweet from Elon a few days ago, but we'll very likely see the beast roar in the first half of the week at the very least. Of course, as impressive as the static fire will be, it will pale in comparison to the launch of Booster 3's successor, Booster 4, which is still having its components fabricated. This will be the booster paired with Ship 20, together performing the first ever orbital flight test of the Starship vehicle. Booster 4 won't just have three Raptor engines, but a total of 29. That seems like a lot, because it is, but clearly not enough for the final non-prototype rocket. Elon Musk confirmed on Twitter that a final decision on the engine number has been reached for the Super Heavy first stage, 33 Raptors, producing 230 metric tons of thrust at sea level apiece, making this rocket far and away the most powerful ever built, surpassing both the Saturn V and the slightly more powerful N1 first stages. Hopefully, the orbital Starship gets a little bit further than the N1 rocket ever made it, though. Ideally, it'll get all the way into space. Once Booster 4 depletes its ascension fuel, it'll separate from the Starship, where it will then Falcon 9 its way down to the Gulf of Mexico for a soft water landing, and then it's all eyes on Ship 20 for the rest of the journey. Really though, it's not the ascent that's going to be the real test of the vehicle, but rather the descent back down to Earth. That's because descending from orbit isn't simply a case of, you know, just falling. We know that starships are sometimes a little bit too good at that, but rather withstanding the extreme heating effects of the Mach 25 speeds. Look at the flames on this amazing render here from Alexander Svan, showing how this might look. Re-entry is a deadly beast to contend with. Look how cooked dragon capsules are after recovery, for example. To withstand the heating, the starship will be suitably covered in thermal protection tiles. I, I do love the simplicity of the hexagonal mesh that SpaceX are going with. One huge issue shoot with maintaining the Space Shuttle's thermal tiles was how many intricate, complex, and unique shapes there were. With Starship, they're all basically identical. It'll be super quick and super simple to quickly swap out any suspect or damaged tiles before or after a flight. We've seen glimpses of Ship 20 sections as they get wheeled around the manufacturing site, and the vehicle is getting closer and closer to final assembly. As you can see from Brendan Lewis's latest infographic, most of the parts have now been accounted for, and for the parts that are aren't accounted for yet, it's likely that things like the nose cone do exist, it could even be one of the ones in this tent here, but since we haven't seen any evidence showing concrete proof, this is our current picture of Ship 20. Progress on the external structures, such as the launch integration tower, hasn't really changed a huge amount from last week's episode, probably because of limitations due to poor weather among the list of reasons, but we are expecting to see the tower's eighth and final segment added to the top of the structure at some point very soon. Actually, yesterday, Sunday the 18th, it was lifted into the air momentarily, twice in fact, but it was lowered back down on both times. As I sit here watching the live streams, I gotta draw the line somewhere in writing this script and actually 
start recording the episode, so I'm going to have to somewhat anticlimactically end the Starship coverage here with a Section 8 might or might not be at the top of the tower right now. Shrug emoji. I, I just I just wrote shrug emoji in, in, the, in the script. Maybe we'll be able to discuss it more next Monday. For now, I'm going to leave the Starship coverage there and allow us to move along to taking a peek at what else happened last week. This week saw lots of exciting things happen in the world of space. For starters, a shortfall of Gravitas, SpaceX's newest drone ship, arrived at Port Canaveral in Florida. On screen are some excellent aerial photographs from Deimos. Make sure you check out his Twitter at Planet Deimos for more. This is the third drone ship commissioned by SpaceX, and it will perform a similar role to its counterparts Of Course I Still Love You and Just Read the Instructions, and will serve as a landing platform for Falcon 9 first stages that don't have enough fuel to fully boost back to a landing zone at the launch site. A shortfall of Gravitas is somewhat of an upgrade over its predecessors, as, according to Elon Musk, it won't require a tugboat to be towed to the landing area. It's currently undergoing sea trials ahead of its first booster landing attempt, which is expected to be for a Falcon Heavy side booster, B-1065, for the upcoming USS F-44 mission later this year. We also had some news from NASA's Space Launch System. The rocket is really, really close to completion now. The only major component now that needs to be added to the stack is the Orion spacecraft itself, which first needs to be joined with the launch escape tower. The Orion is currently stacked on top of its service module, and last week it was moved inside the launch abort system facility at the KSC to have the launch escape system installed. I know a lot of us had our doubts about the SLS ever flying sometimes with all the delays, but now all of a sudden things are really coming together, and they're coming together quick. I can't wait to see this beast of a rocket take flight later this year, and I'm confident that this time around NASA will be able to meet their launch target and give us all a spectacular show. On the topic of NASA news, the mad lads at NASA finally managed to return the Hubble Space Telescope to scientific operations. On the 13th of June, as I'm sure you're all aware, the telescope put its systems into safe mode after experiencing an unexpected problem. Since we can no longer send up a space shuttle to make repairs, we were all starting to get worried that this might be curtains for the faithful telescope. Happily, the team at NASA managed to diagnose that the problem was likely due to the power control unit, basically the telescope's PSU, and on the 15th of July, they successfully switched the systems to backup hardware, and this seemed to do the trick. They confirmed on Twitter that all instruments on the Hubble Space Telescope are now in operational status, and science data is once again being collected to further our understanding of the universe. Now, those were the major events from the world of spaceflight that took place last week that I wanted to talk about. There weren't actually any orbital or suborbital launches, funnily enough. So, let's moosey on over to the next segment of the video. All the launches we can expect to see this week. The first launch of the week will take place in the early hours of today, actually, the 19th of July, and will be a Chinese Long March 2C, which will place three Yaogan 30 reconnaissance satellites into low Earth orbit. Next up, the Battle of the Billionaires continues. After the success of Richard Branson's Spaceship 2, Jeff Bezos will fly aboard the New Shepard on mission NS-16, which will take place on the 20th of July. This will be the 16th flight of the rocket, and the first time that it'll carry crew. Joining Jeff will be his brother Mark, Dutch student Oliver Damon, and pilot and Mercury 13 candidate Wally Funk. Those last two are interesting picks, as at the ages of 18 and 82 respectively, this mission will carry both the youngest and oldest astronauts into space. Wally Funk never got to fly to space while in the Mercury 13 program, an all-female astronaut program to put the first American woman in space. Despite excelling in her astronaut training, the program was cancelled before the women were to undergo the last of their pre-flight tests. At least now, 61 years later, she'll finally get her astronaut wings. The day after New Shepard, Russia will launch a Proton-M rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Here's some clips of the rocket being prepared. Inside the payload fairing is the Norka module, also known as the Multipurpose Laboratory Module, a brand new component for the International Space Station. This was actually supposed to be launched all the way back in 2007, but due to a variety of delays, this has now turned into July 2021. It'll dock with the Zvezda module at the station on the 29th of July. The launch will also carry the European robot 
robotic arm, which will be the first robot arm able to work on the Russian space station segments, and is very interesting in that it can sort of walk around the exterior of the Russian segments, moving hand over hand between prefixed base points. Here's hoping that this launch goes well, and all systems work as expected. Launches aside, another thing happening this week is the 35th perijove of the Juno spacecraft, which will take place on the 20th of July and will mark the beginning of Juno's second mission extension. The spacecraft will now continue its studies of Jupiter until at least September 2025, and this new mission expansion will see it explore both Jupiter and its rings and its moons, with multiple rendezvous planned for three of the Galilean moons, Ganymede, Europa and Io. Good luck to you, our most distant planetary orbiter. And that's a wrap on the best things to look forward to this week, so now it's time for our final section, all the most interesting historic anniversaries that'll be taking place this week. The first anniversary of the week takes place today, the 19th of July, when in 1963, Joseph A. Walker flew a North American X-15 space plane to a record of 106 kilometers high, therefore crossing the Kármán line or the internationally generally accepted boundary of space, qualifying his flight as a human spaceflight under international convention. While it's often said that 13 of the X-15's total of 199 flights were space flights, this is based on the US definition of space, which is 20 kilometers lower than the international definition. Joseph A. Walker was the only X-15 pilot to exceed 100 kilometers and therefore conduct a human spaceflight under international definition. Interestingly, he managed to do this not only once, but twice, on two separate flights obviously, therefore making him the first person to ever fly to space twice. On the 20th of July, we'll see the 1976 anniversary of the American Viking 1 lander's successful touchdown on the surface of Mars. And here is the first ever clear picture ever taken from the surface. Wow, that must have been quite an amazing achievement. I know that we almost take Mars landings for granted these days, but they are still monstrously difficult to pull off, and this would be especially true in the 1970s when things like this were still largely designed using slide rules. Viking 1 carried a biology experiment whose purpose was to look for evidence of life, and in addition to this, the lander also sported a mass spectrometer that was designed to measure the composition and abundance of any organic compounds in the soil. Unfortunately, it got negative results across the board, except in one experiment, although this is now widely believed to simply be a false positive rather than a true positive. If Martians really are out there, then unfortunately we're yet to find them. On the 21st of July in 1961, astronaut Gus Grissom became the second ever American to go into space on Mercury Redstone 4. This was a suborbital flight designed to test and validate the Mercury spacecraft ahead of the first orbital flight aboard the Atlas. The mission went well, although recovery of the spacecraft not so much. While Grissom was recovered safely, the Mercury capsule itself ended up sinking, and it wouldn't be recovered until 1999, nearly 40 years after its historic flight. Big one now, on the 21st of July in 1969, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin became the first men to walk on the moon. I feel like I should really talk more about this anniversary given its historical significance, but I mean, I don't know what I could possibly say in the short format of this show that you didn't already know. It was epic, amazing, and the crew of Apollo 11, and of course the mighty rocket that they flew on, will be remembered for the rest of humanity. So moving on, on the 22nd of July in 1962, the United States launched the Mariner 1 spacecraft. This was destined to head to Venus and perform the first ever American flyby of the planet. Sadly though, this wasn't to be, as shortly after takeoff the rocket veered off course and had to be destroyed by range safety. Oh well, at least its successor, Mariner 2, would end up being a bit more successful. On the 25th of July in 1973, the Soviet Union launched the Mars 5 space probe. This was a spacecraft that carried an array of instruments to study Mars, including cameras, a radio telescope, and many others. The spacecraft entered orbit around Mars around seven months after launch, but unfortunately shortly after achieving orbit, the pressurized instrument compartment began to leak and the spacecraft subsequently failed soon after. 
It was still able to do a few things. It sent back 180 photographs, of which 43 were of usable quality, as well as measurements of the planet's surface composition and ozone layer. The launch of the Mars 5 probe was the final anniversary I wanted to discuss this week, which therefore brings an end to this week's historical anniversary rundown. <laughs> And that's it for another episode of Space This Week. I guess this past week wasn't the most exciting when it comes to rocket launches, but it's looking like the next seven days should more than make up for that. I'm particularly excited to watch Jeff Bezos and co make the first human spaceflight on New Shepard. New crewed launch vehicles, even if they're not orbital, are always super fun to watch launch. And hey, if you're watching this, Jeff, if you hook me up with a ticket, then I promise I'll give your little website a shout out on this channel. And that's a... That's a promise. Anyway, on screen, you might have seen my Patreon scrolling on the left. If you want to join their ranks, you can do so by clicking my Patreon join button on screen or via the one in the description. You can also join the Lounge Squad to get a cool badge next to your name and some unique emojis to spam in the comments down below. And hey, once you've done all that, make sure you subscribe and like the video. It really helps me out. And check out either of the two videos on screen if they tickle your fancy perchance. Anyway, I've said my piece. Thank you guys so much for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one.